Good morning, Moirev Rabbi Sai, ladies and gentlemen. Today's shear is sponsored by Rabbi Yitzchok and Ahuva Shapiro in honor of the upcoming yard site of Rabbi Yitzchok Shapiro's father, the 23rd day of Tevis, Rabbi Sral Moshe, Rabbi Avram Doiv HaKoyen, his Neshama should have an Aliyah, and his family should be blessed with only the most wonderful brachas and simchas. Thank you for your sponsorship. There's a great Jewish story. Um, well, all great, all Jewish stories are great, but this one is, it resonates with us particularly well. Um, it's about a rabbi, a rav, who's a great big scholar, and uh, he has a son that he loves very much, and he really wants his son to learn to study Torah, but uh, he doesn't have time to teach his son Torah. He's busy. So he hires a malamed, and because his son is a real Eloy, a muhsher, because his son is really a gifted student, he hires the best malamed money can hire to teach his son Gemara, Talmud, Torah, all the, all the things a wonderful Jewish boy has to study. Anyways, the Malamud, of course, is incredibly accomplished, and he sits down and studies with the son, and he's getting paid well, and the son is invested, and everything seems to be going well. Except that one night around the dinner table, the young boy, the student, tells his father, the Rav, that he's struggling with his studies. What's the problem, the father asks, what's the matter? I've hired you the greatest Malamud. So the young man, the boy, the young man explains to his father they're studying a, a, a particularly difficult, a particularly thorny passage in Talmud. And they've been struggling with it for a few days. And the kid says, I don't really understand what the Malamud is saying. He keeps trying and he keeps explaining. We're both getting frustrated. The teacher is getting frustrated. The student is getting frustrated. We're not getting anywhere. And the kid says to his father, maybe you can help. The father says, look, I'm very busy right now. I have to go. I have to take a meeting, whatever the case may be. But tomorrow, um, you know, during the day, I'll come by the, uh, the, the place of learning, right? I'll pretend like I'm looking for a safer or something like that. And I'll pretend to, I'll, I'll walk in. I'll pretend to be there, uh, you know, sort of by the way, casually. And I'll ask what you guys are learning and get, I'll get involved and I'll see if I can help. All right. The next day, at, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, the father, the Rav, shows up and uh, he pretends he's looking for a book or he's there for something else. And he walks in and he hears the student, uh, the, the teacher, the Malamba, teaching the student. And of course, they're stuck in the middle of this terribly dense and, and, and nuanced passage in Talmud and they're struggling. So the father walks in. No, what are you guys learning? How's it going? Da -da 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 -da. And uh, they start talking to the father. They start talking to the Rav about this particular passage. Sure enough, he sits down and he joins in their discussion and he starts to slowly, he takes over and he starts to slowly explain patiently uh, every aspect, every nuance of this sugya, of this Talmudic discussion. And within whatever it is, a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, he presents it to his son, the student, in a way that the teacher had not done before and like a light goes on in the student, in the young man's head, boom. The idea comes to life and he actually understands it. And everything they've been struggling with for the past couple of days, you know, is now, uh, is now making sense. And the students, the young man's eyes light up and he goes, wow, you know how it is when your own father explains something to you and it all comes together. Oh, Sfasai Mishak, he says, thank you very much. And the father gets up to leave. As the father's about to leave, the father becomes sensitive, becomes aware that the Malamut, the one who was actually hired to teach this particular piece of Talmud, um, is terribly embarrassed, feels, feels rotten. Here he is, the one who was hired to teach the student. Here he is supposed to be the professional, struggling with this for days. The father walks in and within an hour, boom, he explains it all and the kid understands it and the kid's so excited and so relieved. Now the Malamud, the teacher is relieved too that the student finally understands it, but it doesn't feel nice to be upstood that way. In one hour, the father managed to do what the, what the teacher, the hired professional couldn't do in a few days. So to make the Malamud feel better, the father, the Rav, tells the student and the teacher, his son and the Malamud that he's hired, he says, I want to tell you a story. 
I'm not a story, uh, an analogy, a muscle. He says there was once a man who was very hungry. He had worked very hard, spent a couple of days doing something, and he was just, he found himself ravished, starving. So he looks around for something to eat. He goes into a bakery and he orders a roll. He washes, he sits down, he eats the roll, and guess what? He's still hungry. So he orders another roll. And he eats the second roll, and he's still hungry. He had worked very hard. He had a tremendous appetite. He goes through 10 rolls, and he's still hungry. After 10 rolls, the guy says, obviously, rolls are not going to satiate my hunger. He orders a bagel. Eats the bagel, and after he eats the bagel, Baruch Hashem, he's satisfied. He's no longer hungry, and he's full. He benches, and he gets up to leave. And as he's about to leave, he turns to the store owner, and he says, do me a favor. Next time I come in here to this bakery and I tell you that I'm hungry and I tell you that I want to order a roll to satiate my hunger, remind me not to eat rolls and only to eat bagels. Rolls don't work. Bagels work. If I would have known, forget about ordering the rolls. I would have just ordered the bagel and I would have been satisfied. So from now on, it's only bagels for me and not rolls. Obviously, silly thing to say. Rather, it wasn't the bagel alone that satisfied him. It was the bagel in accumulation after he had eaten 10 rolls and then he ate the bagel. No, 10 rolls and a bagel were enough to satiate him. It was the accumulation of everything together. A fool thinks it's just the bagel that I ate at the end that made me full. The 10 rolls I ate beforehand did nothing. A fool thinks that way. A wise man understands that everything together is what gives the satisfied feeling. So the father turns to the malamed and turns to the son. He says, it wasn't my one hour explanation alone that made you understand this particular passage of Talmud. It was rather, it was everything together. The malamed had taught it to you for a couple of days, right? And then after a couple of days, then I came in like as the bagel at the end of 10 roll and explained it once more and you got it. All right, he was trying to make the malamed feel better. You know, sometimes you have this with, if you have um, a bottle, with a stubborn cap that won't open, you know, like one of those soda cans or, or you know, or wine bottles, something like that has a really stubborn cork or a really stubborn uh, a cap on the top. And you got, you know, people struggling and struggling. It gets passed around the table. Everybody has a turn, you know, to try to wedge this thing open. When I was a kid, my grandmother, Zolzan Gesund, taught me actually a very useful tip for this. You see, you, you got to come to my parsha here to learn how to, how to open stubborn bottles. She said, what you do is you turn it up, or stubborn cans. What you do is you turn it upside down and you gently whack it on the floor or whack it on the table and release some of the pressure. But anyways, you pass this thing around and everybody gives the shot <laughs> until at some point in the end, somebody goes, ta-da, and opens it. So what's the shot? Everybody else is weak, weaklings and this person at the end is stronger than everybody else they could do it? Not necessarily. Could be it's an accumulation of everybody's efforts together that's able to finally open, uh, open this bottle and release it. Okay. I say this as an introduction to our parsha shir. This week, of course, we're studying, we're starting a new chumash, chumash mois. We study parsha mois, And the Torah rushes uh, right into um, the story of the Yidden in Mitzrayim. It rushes right into the, the Shibud Mitzrayim. The Jewish people are enslaved. They are subjugated. Within a short few psukim, um, the Torah tells us that they're forced into hard labor. Moshe Rabbeinu is born. It seems, again, it seems in the beginning of the Parsha as if the Torah is rushing to just get, you know, to tell to, this, the story of Moshe Rabbeinu's birth is literally told like this. A man married a woman. Um, he was from the house of Levi. Uh, the woman got pregnant and she gave birth to a son. Like that's how the Torah tells the story. Very interesting. <clears throat> very interesting. Anyways, we're introduced to Moshe Rabbeinu. And again, without the Torah telling us very much about his life, um, we're, we're taken straight uh, to Moshe Rabbeinu at the burning bush. So if you have a Chumash in front of you, we're going to go to Ravi, this is Pera Gimel, Pasuk Aleph. The Torah tells us, Moshe Rabbeinu was shepherding the sheep of his father-in-law, Yisroi, and he came to Harho, Lekim Chayrevo, he came to Mount Chayrev, which Rashi tells us is actually Har Sinai, and he has the famous experience of, the, of Hashem appearing to him at the burning bush. 
an angel of Hashem, first an angel, appears to Moshe Rabbeinu, in the heart of a fire from inside the snare, from inside the bush. And Moshe Rabbeinu sees the snare, the, the bush is consumed with fire, is burning with fire, excuse me. But the, but the bush itself is not being consumed. And Moshe Rabbeinu turns around to take a look. And Vayar Hashem, Posek Dalet, Vayar Hashem, Kisor Lirois, Hashem has seen that Moshe Rabbeinu turns to see, Vayikro Elov and Lekim Itoi Chasneh, and Almighty God calls out to Moshe Rabbeinu from inside the bush, Vayoymer, and he says, Moshe, Moshe, Vayoymer Hineini. Hashem calls out to Moshe Rabbeinu from the bush, and Moshe Rabbeinu says Hineini. All right. Hashem tells him to take off his shoes, Posek Vav, Vayoymer, and then Hashem introduces himself to Moshe Rabbein for the first time. For the further, they're having a, uh, a, a conversation, or so it seems, really, for the first time. By Yoimer and Hashem says, I am the God of your father. The God of Avraham, Yitzchok, God of, the God of your father, the God of Avraham, Yitzchok, and Yaakov. By Yaster Moshe Ponov says the Postuk Moshe Rabbeinu hid his face. Either he turned around or he covered it with his hands. But either way, by Yaster Moshe Ponov, the Postuk says Moshe hid his face. Ki yore me he was afraid to look at, at Alakim. He was afraid to look at Hashem. Okay. Hashem has not yet told Moshe Rabbeinu what it is that he wants from him. Hashem is about to tell him that he sees the suffering of the Yidin in Mitzrayim, and Hashem says to Moshe, you're going to go and take them out of Mitzrayim, etc. But the, the experience of the burning of the bush begins with Moshe Rabbeinu, um, with Moshe Rabbeinu being called out to from within the bush. The, the, the verbal exchange begins with a voice calling out to Moshe Rabbeinu saying, Moshe, Moshe. Moshe responds by saying, Hineni. He's told, Moshe is told to remove his shoes and not to approach. The place that you're standing on is holy, Hashem tells Moshe. He tells him, I, I, I'm the God of your fathers, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And Moshe Rabbeinu's response is to hide his face, because he was afraid uh, to, look upon, to look upon Hashem. So, so again, as far as Moshe Rabbeinu is concerned, there's very little, we, know, we, we don't know much about what Moshe Rabbeinu is doing, you know, etc. The Torah tells us he turned to see when Hashem called out to him and said, Moshe, Moshe, he said, Ineni. And when Hashem introduced himself and told him who he was, Moshe's response is, Vayaster Moshe upon him, he hides his face. He hides his face, because he's afraid to look at Hashem. Okay. The Gemara and Masech the Brochus seems to present an argument between Rabbi Shua ben Korcho and Rabbi Shmuel ben Nachmeni, regarding this detail specifically that Moshe hid his face. On this, by Yaster Moshe Ponov, there seems to be an argument in the Gemara. On the surface, it seems like the argument is, was this a good thing or a bad thing? Was this uh, an appropriate reaction or an inappropriate reaction? Is this, is this the reaction of Moshe to be praised? Was Moshe praised for this? Was Moshe rewarded for this? Or was, this, or was this something that was on Moshe Rabbeinu's end that was a deficiency, that was lacking? Okay. The first opinion, Rabbi Shua ben Korcha says, that actually this was a deficiency on Moshe's end. And he paid dearly, he paid a dear heavy price for this response. By Yasser Moshe Ponov, for him hiding his face, concealing himself, concealing his, he doesn't want to look at Hashem, Says Rabbi Shua ben Korcha, he paid very heavily for this. What happened? You may remember that in a couple of parshias from now, in Parshas Kisisa, at the end of the story of the, after the Torah tells the story of the Egel Azov and, and all the rest of it, there's a passage there where Moshe Rabbeinu asks to see Hashem. Moshe says, Moshe wants to actually see Hashem. And Hashem tells him it's not possible. 
Nobody can see me and remain alive. Okay. Instead, what happens? Hashem puts Moshe Rabbeinu into a rock and he puts, Hashem puts his hand over the rock and Hashem passes by and Moshe comes out. The Torah says he saw Hashem from the back. He was able to see the back of Hashem, but not the front. Says Rabbi Shuban Korcha, the reason why Hashem told Moshe in Parshas Kisisa that he would not see Hashem's face was not because Moshe was inherently unable to see Hashem. Actually, Moshe was able. Hashem can do anything. Hashem was, if Hashem wanted, Hashem was able to show himself to Moshe Rabbeinu, and Moshe Rabbeinu could have remained alive. Either because he would empower Moshe Rabbeinu, or he would show Moshe Rabbeinu as much as a human being can handle, whatever the case may be. So why is Moshe Rabbeinu's request, Moshe wants to see Hashem? Why is it, re- why is it rejected? Why does Hashem say no? Omar Le'a Kodesh Baruch Hu Moshe says, Rav Shua Ben Korach Mesech the Brachas Dav Zayin Amen Aleph, the Rabbi Nishleilam said to Moshe, Hear those words. Hashem said to Moshe, what do you mean? You want us, now you're asking to see me? The first time we met at the burning bush, remember? Remember our first date? In the middle of the desert, Har Olekim Chayreva on Har Sinai. I called out to you from inside the burning bush and I was ready to reveal myself to you. And I said, And what did you do, says Hashem to Moshe? Vayaster Moshe Ponov, you concealed your face. I was ready, I wanted, and it wasn't just ready. Shiratisi, I wanted, says Hashem, to show myself to you. You, Moshe, didn't want. You said no. Now you want, I say no. Now you want to see me? Now I'm saying no. It's a passage of Gomorrah that needs to be understood. But this is clear according to Abishub and Korcha. Moshe Rabbeinu faces a consequence for hiding his face, for concealing himself from Hashem. Later when Hashem, later when Moshe will want to experience a godly revelation, Hashem will say no, because Moshe Rabbeinu had chosen to hide his face and not look at Hashem at the burning bush. That's the first opinion. The second opinion is that of Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani says, quote, Bishar Sholosh, Zoichel Sholosh. In the merit of three things that the Torah tells us here at the burning bush, Moshe merited three great blessings. The Torah says, Vayaster Moshe upon him, by the burning bush, Vayaster Moshe upon him, Moshe hid his face. Kiyore, because, simply because he was afraid, may habit to look upon Hashem. Says Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachbeini, Bishar Vayaster Moshe, in the schus of Moshe hiding his face, he merited, quote, Ki koran oir pnei Moshe, when Moshe will come down from Har Sinai with the second set of luchas, the Torah says, Koran oir pon of his face was shining. That was because Moshe had hid his face at the burning bush. It says Moshe hid his face at the burning bush Kiyori, because he was afraid to look at Hashem. In the schus of, the, of his fear of looking at Hashem, he merited Zohar by Yiru that the Jews were afraid to approach Moshe when they saw how his face was shining when he came down from Hashinai the, the third time with the second set of Luchas. And in the schus of the fact that he was afraid to look at Hashem at the burning bush, he merited that Hashem will say about him later, quote, to Hashem Yabit, that he was able to see the image of Hashem. According to this explanation, it seems clear that Moshe's, that Moshe's efforts to hide, to conceal his face at the burning bush, to be praised, perhaps for his humility, perhaps for his, for his understanding that, that it is not the place of a human being to gaze upon Hashem, be it as it may, in the schos of this, he merits to have this Koran or to have this shine from his skin, his fa- the, the radiation that came off his face when he came down from Harsina with the second set of luchas, with the second set of luchas to the point that the Jews were afraid to approach. All right. 
This is an argument in the Gemara. Again, there's every every part of it is is you know is expounded upon, but an argument in the Gemara, which seems at least on the surface to be a, an analysis of whether or not Moshe did the right thing by hiding his face. Okay. Now it's become the unofficial minag in these uh, in these parshas to discuss an interpretation of the Balaturim. So I found one. I found a I found a Balaturim which intrigued me. I also, to be honest with you, um, I don't remember ever hearing this before or ever learning this before. Um, in fact, I, I looked around at my favorite uh, place to do research on Google, um, and I, I was not even able to find um, much discussion about this particular comment of the Balaturim. Um, and it is truly, truly fantastic. I'm going to read it. It's, it's three lines. I'm going to read it inside and translate. And then with, with Hashem's help, we'll try, to, we'll try to give some understanding of it. On the words, Vayaster Moshe. Moshe Vayaster Moshe Ponov, excuse me. Moshe Rabbeinu hid his face. Says the Bala Turim in his inimitable style. Beis B'Mesur. The word Vayaster. Says the Bala Turim, the word Vayaster appears twice in the Torah. By the way, I, I just want to interject here because somebody asked me about something that I had said. I quoted a Bala Turim that says that the word last week, that the words Alamito only appear twice in the Torah. Um, he said, well, anyway, Alamito appears only twice in the Torah. Um, so, so, you know, what he means is that this, when, when he says something only appears twice or in certain places, he means the specific, precise way the way it's worded, the way it's, it's you know, or if it's two words, the, the phraseology of these two words together, that only appears twice in the Torah. The word mito applies many places in the Torah. The word al appears probably thousands of times in the Torah. But the combination al ha mito, it's not relevant to this year. I'm just saying we discussed it last week. The, the, the phrase al ha mito is only twice in the Torah. So the, the word hastir, hastir apply, it appears many places in the Torah. This is the way I understand it. But this exact term, vayaster, vayaster, says the Balaturim, you have it twice in all of Tanakh. That's it. One, in our Pasuk, in our Chumash, in, in our uh, story of the burning bush. Vayaster Moshe Ponov, he hid his face. Where's the other one? Right? When I read it, sometimes I try to ask myself, do I know? Where's I? I have no idea. Vayaster Omol Me'enoi. Anybody recognize that Pasuk? Vayaster Omol Me'enoi. It's from Eev Paragimel Pasekiot. Vayaster Omol Me'enoi means Eev says, Eev is suffering in the beginning of, of well, throughout the entire Sefer Eev, as is well known. Hashem has, Hashem has allowed the Satan to, to make Eev's life miserable on every level. Um, family members, he, he loses family members, he loses his wealth, he loses his health, he loses everything actually a human being can possibly lose. Um, Eev loses. Hashem empowers the Satan to take it all from him as a test, whatever that means. And Eev, in his moment of great pain, again, pain on every level, curses the day he dies. Curses, excuse me, the day he was born. He wishes he was never born. The, the full verse actually reads, if only God would have closed the womb of my mother and not have allowed me to be born, to, to emerge into this world, then then he would, then Hashem would have concealed all of this suffering from my eyes. But alas, says Eev, the day that I was born, may it be cursed brought me into this world where I experienced so much pain. Why Svayaster, says the Balaturim. Vayaster Moshe Ponov, Moshe hides his face at the burning bush, and Vayaster Omo Me'enoi, Eev prays, wishes, well, he doesn't pray, but he wishes that the day he would have been born would have been the day he would have died in his mother's womb. And then all of this pain that he would be that he would that he is going through would have been concealed from his eyes. Okay. What's the connection? What's the connection between Moshe hiding his face at the burning bush and Eve wishing that he would have died on the day of his birth? 
So all of this pain that he's going through would, would, through would have been concealed from his eyes. She'ilu hoyom and the Bala says the Bala Turim something astounding. She'ilu hoyom abit b'ziv hashchina. Had Moshe Rabbeinu, says the Bala Turim, not concealed his face and gazed directly at the Shechina b'toy chasneh as it appeared in the burning bush. V'hoyom mevakesh rachamim al Yisrael and would have implored, he would have pleaded with the Rabbein HaShleilam for the sake of the Jews. Loi hoyu goylim yoisa. Jewish history would have no more goals. Why? He has nehu simen imoyonoichi betzara. The reason, quotes the Balatun from the Medrash, that Hashem appears to Moshe in the burning bush is to show Moshe Rabbeinu that as long as the Jews are suffering, the Rabbeinu Shlalem himself is also suffering. The bush was a thorn bush. Anybody who is stuck in a thorn, in a thorn bush is going to be in a lot of pain. The thorns hurt. Hashem shows, appears to Moshe Rabbeinu <coughs> in the thorn bush to show Moshe Rabbeinu that as the Jews suffer, so Hashem suffers, so Hashem suffers along together with them. And just as the Jews want to suffer no more, so Hashem wants them to suffer no more. So if Moshe Rabbeinu would have used that vulnerable moment to implead with Hashem, to, impl to implore with Hashem that the Jews suffer no more, his wish would have been granted. And quote, Loi hoyu goylem yoiser. The Jews would no longer be enslaved. It doesn't just mean, the Balaturim doesn't just mean that they would no longer be enslaved in Mitzrayim. That, that's no big deal. They're about to be taken out of Mitzrayim. Loi hoyu goylem yoiser means that for all of Jewish history, for the rest of Jewish history, there would not be another day in Golos for the Jewish people. It was it. And this concludes the Balaturim is the reason why the word Vayaster is used only two places in the Torah. Moshe hid his face and Eve wished he would have never seen any suffering. And now, now the Balaturim drives it home. Had Moshe not concealed his face your master Omol Me'enai, Almighty God, would never have suffered again. She'im loy your master Ponov, your master Omol Me'enai, Almighty God Himself, the Rabbanu Shlomo says, Vayaster Omol Me'enai, I wish you would have removed suffering from me. All you needed to do, Hashem says to Moshe, was rip your hands, your arms away from your face. Stop hiding. Look at me. Davin for the sake of the Jews asked me to have mercy on them. I would have granted it. And there would never be another dark day in Golis. According to this, Vayaster Moshe Ponov, Moshe Ben hiding his face, has catastrophic repercussions that reverberate throughout all of Jewish history till this very day, as we sit here and learn this in 2023. We're here in Golis. Because Moshe hid his face at the burning bush. The first base of Mikdash was destroyed. The second base of Mikdash was destroyed. All of the Tzorahs that the Eden went through in Golis for all the thousands of years that we went through is all this is an astounding thing to say. The Balaturim says it's all because Moshe hid his face at the burning bush. If he hadn't, if he would have looked straight at the Rabbanu Shlomo and said, "What are you doing? The Jews are suffering. You're suffering. Nobody wants this." Hashem would have said, you're right, and that would have been the end of it, and the Jews would, ne would have never had another day in Golis. All right. Astounding. All right. After the initial shock of what the Balaturim says wears off, we're stuck with a couple of questions. A couple of obvious questions, right? First of all, did Moshe Rabbeinu know this? Did Moshe know that by hiding his face, he was, he was facilitating thousands of years of the Jewish people being in Golis? If yes, why did he do it? If no, why is he being criticized for it? 
number one. Number two, is this some kind of a game? Hashem says to Moshe, I wish you would have davened to, to me to make the Jews stop suffering. I was suffering so much, I would have just ended it. But now that you didn't, ah, now the Jews are going to go back into Golis. What in heaven's name is that supposed to mean? <laughs> why, does, <laughs> why does Hashem need Moshe Rabbeinu to daven to him to make the Jews stop suffering? If the Jews are suffering and if Hashem is suffering and Hashem doesn't like it, Hashem can make it stop. What does he need? Moshe Rabbeinu's permission? Moshe Rabbeinu, he needs Moshe Rabbeinu to, to daven and only then he stops? Why? Very difficult to understand. And then let's ask what I think is the mother question here. This conversation between Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu goes on for seven days. <laughs> right? Imagine. Seven days. Moshe stood at the burning bush and conversed with Hashem. Actually, the conversation takes up the bulk, the vast majority of the parsha is taken up by this seven-day conversation between Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu. And to be honest, it doesn't go very well. They don't really converse for seven days. They argue, and they argue bitterly and miserably. Moshe Rabbeinu makes at least five excuse. well, Moshe Rabbeinu presents at least five arguments for why he doesn't want to point blank refuses to be the one to take the Eden out of Mitzrayim. The reasons, the, the, the reasons Moshe Rabbeinu give vary from number one, he says, me or Neichi, who am I? His humility. He tells Hashem the Jewish people are not going to listen to him. He tells, the, he tells Hashem that he doesn't know what Hashem's name is. What am I going to tell the Jews is your name? Difficult to understand, but that's what he says. He tells the Rabbi Shalom, we can't talk. And the Rabbani Shalom sits and refutes and explains and reassures and, and, and tells them, what do you mean? The Jewish people will listen to you and I'll go with you and everything is going to be great and you're going to succeed and, and, and it's going to work. And, ah, da, 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 da. and in the end, Moshe Rabbeinu tells Hashem, you know what? Quote, Shlach no tishlach, which translates to literally, literally to, to mean literally, why don't you just send somebody else? I'm sure you have other people to send. Just send them. And the Pasuk says that Hashem got angry and told Moshe Rabbeinu, that's not how this works. Do I need to remind you I'm the bot? You'll go because I told you to. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't respond to that. He goes. He actually goes to fulfill the mission of Hashem and he does in the end take the Jewish people out of its rhyme. But you don't at any point get from Moshe Rabbeinu a sense that he gave Hashem a verbal response and said, all right, let's do it. Nowhere. They just argued for seven days. <laughs> right? Imagine you went out on a shidduch <laughs> with a young man or a young woman, right? You go out on a date and for the first time, for this, as far as the, 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 what we know from the Torah, this is the first time Hashem and Moshe speak. Hmm. And the date goes on for seven, day, seven days. You can't agree on anything. <laughs> Does that sound like love at first sight? Does that sound like a marriage? I mean, how are they supposed to make this work? And by the way, it's not the last time Hashem and Moshe Benu argue either. So why does Moshe argue with Hashem so much? Hashem comes and says, take the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim. Moshe's arguing and arguing. Why? Well, one of the reasons, one, one, of the, one, of, one of the many elements to it, one of the many aspects to it, actually is articulated beautifully by a Rashi on the words shlach no biyat tishlach. I want to read this. It's a, it's a, it's a short Rashi. Um, but it, it articulates the point beautifully. All right, so Rashi gives two explanations. The first explanation Rashi says is that Moshe Rabbeinu said, send Aaron. <laughs> Aaron is articulate, Aaron can speak, send Aaron. The Varach, another explanation says Rashi, 
Moshe Rabbeinu tells Hashem, second explanation of Rashi, open your hearts. Moshe Rabbeinu says something profound. He says to Hashem, we're standing here arguing for seven days, yes? You want me to take the Yidin out of Mitzrayim? You want me to take them out? Moshe says, but I know the truth. In the end, it's not really me that you want. In the end, you're going to want someone else. She'ein soifi lachnisam l'oretz. I said, Moshe Rabbeinu, in the end, they're not going to be the one to take them into Eretz Yisrael. And ein soifi lachnisam l'oretz v'liyo is goylem l'osid. And I'm not going to be the one who redeems them in the end. I'm not going to be their final redeemer. You've got someone else in mind. Yesh l'chosh l'chem harbe. This is a long process, is Moshe Rabbeinu. I don't want to be part of it. Moshe says to Hashem, I know how this works. I know how this works. Moshe sees the future, apparently. I'm going to take them out of Mitzrayim with all the most wonderful promises about going into Eretz Yisrael. It's not going to materialize. I'm going to die in the desert. The people that I take out of Mitzrayim, that generation are going to die in the desert. Their children are going to go into Eretz Yisrael and after 850 years be banished. The build a second base of English, it'll be destroyed. And in three and a half thousand years from now, the Jewish people are going to be standing in Shemun Esrei and davening from Mashiach. It's not really me you want, says Moshe. Shlach no tishlach. So whoever it is that you have in mind is going to be their final redeemer. Why don't we just get it over with and send them now? Okay. This makes the commentary of the Balaturim impossibly difficult to understand, seemingly. Because what he's really said, because what Moshe Rabbeinu is really saying is that he doesn't, he, he doesn't want, one of the reasons why he doesn't want to be sent by Hashem to take the Eden out of Mitzrayim is because this is not the final redemption. He's telling Hashem, don't send me, don't puppeteer me and send me to the Jews with all sorts of promises of redemption. This is going to turn out to be a horrible disappointment. Let's be part of it. That's what he's saying. Send Mashiach, the final redeemer, not me. Okay. Says the Balaturim, Moshe Rabbeinu himself could have ended the whole thing. He could have ended the whole thing. And all he had to do was move his hand away from the front of his face. Stop hiding. If he had stopped hiding his face, he would be able to daven for the sake of the Jewish people. Quote, they would never experience another day in Golis. So look how twisted this thing becomes. So Moshe Rabbeinu hides his face, doesn't take the opportunity to daven to Hashem so that there'll be no more Golos. Instead, he doesn't take the opportunity. The Jewish people are destined to more Golos. And when they're destined to more Golos, Moshe says to Hashem, now you understand me, but you're putting them into, back into Golos. I don't want to be their redeemer from Mitzrayim. I'm not their Goyal Achran. I'm not their final redeemer. But wait, according to the Balaturim, it seems like he could have been. It seems like he could have been their final redeemer. All he had to do was daven to Hashem at the burning bush. And loy hoyu goylum yoyser, they would never be, they would never be in, they would never be another day in Golos. And yet, and yet he doesn't do it. Why not? All right, I believe, of course, th there are and there could be many layers and different ways of explaining it, but I want to, I, I want to shed one element, one, one vort um, on this issue based on the teachings of, of Hasidus, specifically with regard to the concept of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Okay, and here's, here's how I think, here's how I think the idea should be, should be presented the idea should be understood. The Torah tells us that the Yidin were in Mitzrayim for 210 years. Moshe Rabbeinu eventually, despite his seven-day argument with Hashem, in the end, takes the Yidin out of Mitzrayim. 
uh, takes them in the desert, takes them to the desert for 40 years. In the end, it seems, it seems, when you read the story superficially, it seems like the Torah is trying to tell us a great story of Geula, a great story of redemption, right? Even the name in English for the entire Chumash Mois is Exodus. Exodus means they left. What's the story really? The story is that Moshe Amin took the Yidin out of Mitzrayim, split the sea, gave them the Torah, made them Hashem's chosen nation. They built the Mishkan, etc. And eventually they, they even make their way into Eretz Yisrael. All right. There's a terribly, terribly sad irony with all of this. Terrible, ter terribly sad irony. I'll tell you what it is. For all the talk about Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, for all, the, for all the real estate, the biblical real estate, the Torah dedicates to this, 50 times, by the way, in the Chumash, the, the concept of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is mentioned. We mention it twice a day when we say Shema. We mention it when we say Kiddush. We mention it, Zechel Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. It's one of the pinnacle, principal foundations of Yiddishkeit. We became a nation when Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim, yes? For all the talk about Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, this great miracle, the, 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 the fanfare, the excitement, the, the, the miracles that took place, the, the, the exodus, Laman Tizkar, we're told this, Yom Tzeischa Meretz Mitzrayim, we have to remember this and live with this Kol Yimei every day of our lives, according to the Chachamim, even when Mashiach comes, we'll still be talking about Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Let me ask you a question. Take a step back here, objectively. In the end, Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, was it a successful, uh, was it a, a successful enterprise? Was it a successful experience or not? When you start to analyze it, it seems like a horrible failure in truth. Horrible. First of all, 80% of the Jews don't want to leave. They die in Mitzrayim. Secondly, the 20% who do want to leave, after they leave, all they want to do is go back. Every time a crisis, the Torah makes no secret of this, every time a crisis brews, every time anything happens, all they even want to do is go back to Mitzrayim, go back to Mitzrayim. They remember fondly the food they ate in Mitzrayim, or all the rest of it. At one point, they accused Moshe Rabbeinu that the reason why he took them out to die in the desert, why he took them out to the desert, is because there are not enough graves in Mitzrayim. This is, this is, this is just terrible. And the greatest irony of them all. In fact, in the end, when Moshe Rabbeinu finally succeeds and brings the Jewish people to the borders of Eretz Yisrael, delivers them with all the, 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 the trauma and the complaining and the, and the, and the, and the amount of, of, of confusion, the amount of soul gut-wrenching turmoil, trauma that the Jewish people go through. When Moshe Rabbeinu finally brings them literally to the borders of Eretz Yisrael and says, Alei Reish, go into Eretz Yisrael, inherit it, it's yours, Hashem promised it to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Generation of Jews that Moshe Rabbeinu took out of Mitzrayim and brought to the borders of Eretz Yisrael took one look at the land of Eretz Yisrael, flowing with milk and honey, promised to them by Hashem, as their, eternal, as their eternal inheritance and said, no, thank you. They said, no, we don't want to go into Eretz Yisrael. They chose to stay in the desert as a result of which they died in the desert. And actually that generation never really merits to go into Eretz Yisrael. Their children do, but it's never the same. It's easy to get caught up in the excitement. Oh, Moshe came, Aaron came, 10, Marcus, right? 
smote the Egyptians, wiped them out, drowned them in the sea, and crossed over the Yamsuf together with the Jewish people. And the Jewish people emerged triumphant and, 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 and the victors, and they take the Egyptian wealth, and off they march into the sunset. Yes. And what happens when they do march into the sunset? They seem to be on a psychological and emotional, emotional level. The Jews seem to be unable to rid themselves of the trauma of Mitzrayim. They can't. They can't. They, they seem to be unable to be free. For God's sake, they keep literally saying, let's go back to Mitzrayim. And when Moshe Rabbeinu says no, they say, let's appoint a different leader and go back to Mitzrayim. At least in Mitzrayim, they said, we knew where our next meal was coming from. And one of my all-time favorite Midrashim, which Rashi actually brings down, after the Jewish people crossed the Yamsuf, crossed over to the other side, and Almighty God drowned the Egyptians in the sea. The Egyptians were dead. Only Pari remained alive. Otherwise, everybody else, the entire nation, was at the bottom of the sea. The Jewish people were still afraid that the Egyptians were going to come from some other side, from some other direction and pursue them. Almighty God had to deposit the dead Egyptian corpses at the feet of the Jews by the Yamsuf in order for them to finally get it through their heads that they were free. That nobody was coming to chase them and pursue them. That they had nothing to be afraid of. Only then they sang Shira. Only to later still say, let's go back to Mitzrayim. When you look at it that way, it seems like the whole Mitzrayim experience, the whole Yetzirah Mitzrayim experience, forgive me, is a horrible failure. Really? The Jews were li really liberated from Mitzrayim? Were they truly? Doesn't seem like they ever were. They couldn't psychologically and emotionally experience freedom they couldn't do it their children the next generation to a degree are able to they go into Eretz Yisrael they settle the land etc but even they face their own challenges and even the children do not merit to live in Eretz Yisrael forever without going back into Golis when you look at it from that perspective it seems like the whole thing failed <coughs> Hmm. so Hashem tells the, Hashem told Avram of you know, your descendants will be enslaved in a foreign land for 400 years and then they'll leave with great wealth and the Jewish people do and they leave and they have great wealth but their wealth is all material inside themselves in their hearts in their minds in their souls they seem to be unable to shake the slave mentality and let's be honest can we blame them Maybe not. And yet till today, we're still so excited about Yitzhak Mitzrayim. What's so exciting about Yitzhak Mitzrayim? <laughs> Wouldn't it have been better if the Jews hadn't gone to Mitzrayim in the first place? How many Jews died, Rahman al-Islam, at the time of Yitzhak Mitzrayim? 80%. And the Jews that did leave, how much did they suffer? And in the end, when they were finally, again, the part that's most mind-boggling, when they, when they were finally given Eretz Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu served to them on a silver platter. He told them, walk over the border, go into Eretz Yisrael and take it. Had they gone in when Moshe Rabbeinu told them to, they wouldn't have even had to fight. There would have been no war, there would have been no, no need for weapons, nothing, they would have just taken it. The Jewish people looked at it, they looked at themselves and they looked at each other and they said, no, you can't. Maybe many of you know people in life who are like this because of their own internal struggles, because of their own inability to see themselves as free, as powerful, as being able to have happy marriages, successful careers, uh, uh, healthy relationships with their children, because they cannot see themselves as being deserving or capable of it. They actually sabotage every opportunity that comes their way. They sabotage themselves. They sabotage everything around them. They, they, they turn it into dirt. Why? 
because they see themselves a particular way. And it's very hard to change. Okay. Let's go back to Moshe Rabbeinu at the burning bush. Moshe Rabbeinu knows exactly. From the moment Moshe Rabbeinu told Hashem Hineni, Moshe Rabbeinu knew exactly what was going on. They knew that the two, they, they knew that the 400 years, the 400 years, the 210 years were up. He knew he was about to be chosen by Hashem to go take the Eden out of Mitzrayim. The, the, the suffering had ended. Hashem himself, as the Jewish people had suffered, in, appears in the burning bush. Almighty God himself is suffering terribly through this entire moment of Golas. And Hashem calls out to Moshe and says, Moshe, Moshe, and Moshe says, okay, I'm here. I'm here. Now listen carefully to the words of the Balaturim. Moshe says, the Balaturim says, if Moshe Rabbeinu had looked, if Moshe Rabbeinu had gazed right into the bush, right at the Shechina, would have asked for mercy for the Jews. They would never go back into Golis. There would be no more Golis for the Jews. What does he not say? He does not say that the Jews would have been redeemed. He does not say that the Jews would have experienced an actual exodus. He doesn't say that there would have been a v'hoitzesi, a v'hitzalti, a v'goalti, a v'lakachti, a v'hivesi, no. Loi hoyu goylem yoyser, he says. Almighty God said, even Almighty God says, this is too painful. It's too painful. We've we got to root out the pain. I can't do this. I'm prepared to have it stop. There was a moment here, there was an opportunity where they could have ended the godless and the suffering and there would have been, there would have been no more. And Moshe Rabbeinu hides his face. He conceals, his, he doesn't take that opportunity. Why? Well, because the purpose of suffering the purpose of suffering is known only to Hashem. Only Hashem knows why it has to be this way. But when we do go through it, when the Eden do go through a Mitzrayim, the belief, the Torah's belief is that when they come out of it at the, end, at the, at the, at the other end, they're supposed to be a redeemed people. They're supposed to be an empowered people. They're supposed to be a people who are now, who, who have now understood what it means to be a slave. And so they can now slowly experience and embrace freedom. They're supposed to be not just the people that doesn't go into Golas. They're supposed to be a people who are actually, who actually experience Gula. You know, my friends, if a person is in pain, there's two ways of dealing with the pain. One way is to make yourself numb. One way is to take a painkiller. One way is to look for a way to make the pain go away. Anesthesia. The problem with that is that it doesn't solve, it doesn't deal with the root core of the issue. Where did the pain come from? Another way, now the advantage of that way is that you get rid of the pain very easily, right? Take a painkiller. With children, actually, sometimes, with little children, sometimes doctors actually recommend in certain scenarios, I've heard from, from my child, children's pediatrician, they sometimes tell you don't, don't necessarily always rush to give the child a, a painkilling medication. If they're in terrible pain, obviously, yes, but if it's manageable, don't rush into it. Why? Because sometimes we need the pain to show us where the problem really is. We need to know, is the child have a throat ache, an ear ache, a stomach ache? Where's, where's the infection? Where's the problem? If you just, you know, if you just put a lid on it, it makes the pain go away. What about the issue? What about the underlying root problem? To deal with the underlying root cause issue is painful. There's a price to pay for it. 
Many times it cannot be solved in one generation. It has to be solved over many, many, many generations. It can take thousands of years, so to speak, till we, till, till we heal properly. But then when we do on the other end, we heal. If you just put a, if you just put a band-aid, if you just put a lid on the pain, if you just make it go away, it usually surfaces somewhere else. The purpose of Mitzrayim. Again, only Hashem knows why the world, why the human experience, why the Jewish experience has to include pain. But what the Torah has told us is that when you didn't go through this, when you didn't, it, the purpose of going through Mitzrayim <clears throat> and Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim and receiving the Torah is for the Jews to actually experience their own existence to become a liberated free people to become a free nation. So that for all of eternity, when a Jew exists in the United States of America and in Europe and in Australia, wherever a Jew is and whatever a Jew has to deal with, the Jew should always remember, the world doesn't tell me what to do. I tell the world what to do. I don't have to bow down at the world's feet. I'm not Paroi's slave. Paroi is my slave. As a Jew, we're given the purpose of existence is us. That's the story of Mitzrayim. Now, for a Jew to learn this and experience this, I, would, I, I believe the right word is internalize it, is a long and difficult process. And we have to go out of Mitzrayim, and we have to watch Kriyas Yamsuf, and we have to receive the Torah. We have to eat one roll, and a second roll, and a third roll, until in the end we get to the bagel. But it's a very long process. As parents, sometimes we watch our children go through things. We wish more than anything we could take away their pain. We wish we, we, wish we could make our lives, we, we wish we could make our children's lives pain-free. But I'll tell you a very, very painful irony. You know what happens when we give our children a life and we don't allow them to suffer? You, you know what happens when we put a band-aid on every physical or psychological source of pain that our children have and we don't let them feel pain? If we don't let our children feel pain, we set them up for disaster because life is filled with pain, unfortunately. And a person does need to learn to develop the resources to deal with that. And unfortunately, the only way to develop the resources of learning how to deal with it is to deal with it and to fail at it miserably once and twice and three times. That's the story of Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim. It's not a story where God miraculously waved a handkerchief one day and said, okay, Jews, you're now free. That's not the story. Didn't even work. The story is that he gave the Eden the Torah and he gave the Merit Yisrael and he empowered them. He said, here, I'm going to give you tools. How long will it take for the Jewish people to own these tools, to use these tools, to learn, to truly internalize that we have nothing to fear from the world? It can take a long time. But anything valuable takes a long time. In order to absorb any type of message, it takes a while. That's the purpose. I believe this could be on a deeper level, the meaning of what the Balaturim is saying. When Hashem called out to Moshe Rabbeinu from the burning bush, Hashem was calling out to Moshe in the words of the Balaturim, in pain, the Rabbana Shleilam is suffering, a father, a mother, when they watch their child suffer, rivers their kishkas out. The Rabbana Shleilam is crying and saying to Moshe Rabbeinu, let's end this. Yaster Moshe Ponov, and Moshe hides his face. He says to Rabbi Shlelem, We're gonna, now that you, the Rabbi Shlelem, started it, we're gonna see this through. We're not gonna short circuit it. The Jewish people will go through Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim. They'll be freed. They'll be given every opportunity to internalize their own freedom. And every part of Jewish history, every step will bring us one step closer. 
It'll be a process. We're not going to short. We're not going to short circuit the system. We're going to go through it all. Nowadays, Baruch Hashem, we no longer have these types of challenges and the We no longer have time. Hashem continue to protect us. We don't go through the kinds of things that people that that, that that our ancestors went through in the past. But we carry all of this together. We, we, we carry it all in our psyche. From the moment Moshe Rabbeinu stood with the Rabbanu Shalom at the burning bush, the Rabbanu Shalom and Moshe Rabbeinu came to an agreement. The agreement was that this, the cycle of Jewish history is maybe not, not maybe, it's not going to be a pleasant and easy one. But it'll be a process in which Jews learn truly, internally, absorb, they absorb the message. They absorb that the existence of a Jew is not bound by nature. Supernatural. The existence of a Jew is a miracle and learn to live it every, every day of their lives. From the time we read Parsha Shmois and we read of the birth of Moshe Rabbeinu and Moshe Rabbeinu being chosen by Hashem to take the Yidnada Mitzrayim, every one of us looks at our own Mitzrayim. Where are we stuck in Mitzrayim? What's the Mitzrayim that holds us back? What's our source of hunger? Are we trying to run away from it? Are we looking to, to for a quick fix, a pill <laughs> that we can take and make us forget? Or are we ready to roll up our sleeves and uncover the neshama within ourselves that is truly free, that is truly empowered, that is untainted by any of the struggles that we've gone through? and ready to embrace our true identity as Hashem's chosen nation. Have a wonderful Shabbos.